Hi, everyone. Before I get to the episode, I want to take a moment to address the United States Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade on June 24th, which stripped away the right to have a safe and legal abortion. Restricting access to comprehensive reproductive care, including abortion, threatens the health and independence of all people, which we have already seen with abortion bans and restrictions in countries like Poland and Malta. This decision has dire consequences and could have harsh repercussions for other landmark decisions within the United States. I encourage our audience, American and otherwise, to learn more about what you can do to help at podvoices.help. I encourage you to speak up, take care, and spread the word. Welcome to the Elevate Podcast, conversations with women changing the face of business. And now your host, Maricela Herrera. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Elevate Podcast. This is Maricela Herrera. I'm your host. And today I'm here with Myra Robinson, who is going to be my co-host for a couple of episodes and who is the amazing force behind moving and shaking and getting everything ready for our chapter leaders around the world. Hey, Myra, how are you? I'm good. What? An introduction. Oh my gosh, I feel so special. Thank you. <laughs> you are special. Yeah, it's good to be here. I'm excited. Um, you know, I feel that it's such a treasure to be able to work with our leadership teams here. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. But, you know, it's just, yeah, I have good feels and I'm ready to talk today. Feeling nervous? Um, A little, but, I'm you know, totally. we're just... We're just going to go with the flow, you know? It's, don't feel nervous. Imagine we're just having a glass of wine yeah. or a Diet Coke, which is what I'm having currently. <laughs> the wine sounds better, if I'm being honest. I know. I know. <laughs> is it five o'clock yet? Somewhere, right? Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what you do, Myra, so that people know your kind of what you're what you're what your role is at Elevate and how you're supporting our awesome community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am the community success coordinator here. Uh, day to day, I work specifically with our chapter leadership teams uh, to, you know, to ensure they have the support, resources, guidance. You know, essentially, I am their first point of contact. So, and I know I said chapter leadership teams, and you may be asking, what are they? And I'll tell you, each team is composed of an amazing group of women who create localized opportunities for women to network, just have and embrace that sense of community, which is really amazing. So right now we have about a little over three dozen chapters um, and the locations stretch between, you know, nationally within the U.S. and international as well. So you know, that's a little bit what I was alluding to as far as like it just being a pleasure to work with them. They're all like so passionate about, you know, moving the needle, making room for like equality and just to make sure that leadership looks more like the communities that they serve. So really cool. I I absolutely love the work our chapter leaders are doing. They really are a heart and soul of our local communities. And you know, research shows you need a big, big network because you need a place to find opportunities, but you also need that smaller groups and those smaller circles where you can show up as yourself. And, you know, you really can't build relationships like in a, in, in, by screaming into the void. You need those people there to, with you to, to be able to be successful. And, and I think our chapter leaders do a great job of embodying that. Oh, yeah, 100%. I'd agree with that, yeah. So what's up with you, Myra? Tell me, I know you moved recently. How's that yeah. going? Oh, the storm is over now. There's only a couple of boxes left, so thank goodness. And I didn't have to throw too much of his stuff away, which is great. He has good taste. So I at least had that kind of on my shoulders, which was good. Um, but I don't know, like, as of right now, 
like, now that I'm moved in and, like, I'm looking, like, around the house and, like, looking at, like, opportunities to, like, craft or build something, Facebook groups have been absolutely amazing. And I never really got into Facebook groups before, but doing, like, at-home, like, projects and stuff, there's, like, channels and, like, groups for that. Um, Wait, like, they tell you how to do stuff or like yeah like when it comes to like DIY projects they'll share them and like how it went some of them are actually really funny because you know you'll have successes and sometimes you'll have fails (laughs) so seeing what things work what doesn't work or just getting inspired has been really cool from um from those groups oh is this what you're into this week in our segment yeah I'd say and like Another one, which is one of my, I'd probably say this one is my favorite group. It's called, are you ready? I'm ready. It's called Black Girls Club Trader Joe's. It's all about Trader Joe's. Oh, tell me everything. I love TJ's. I am obsessed with, I am obsessed with them. Seriously. I don't have one in my small town, but if I go like down to like our next biggest city, we do have one. And so it's all about food reviews and these women are hilarious and we have a talk your ish Fridays. So it's like every Friday, it's like, it can have nothing to do with Trader Joe's and it can just be about whatever you want, but it's only for that Friday. And as soon as like the hour hits 1201, it's all back to Trader Joe's. I love it. I love it. I love it. What are you into right now? What am I into right now? So... I am keeping it light, and I've discovered the show Central Park. I had never seen it, believe it or not. I love Bob's Burgers, and I have no idea why I had not seen um, Central Park, because A, like I said, love Bob's Burgers. B, I love musicals. And see, I'm obsessed with Central Park. Like, I literally go to the park every day. I live right by it. And um, that's where I'm training for my marathon. And that's where I run. And so it's like my backyard. So I am now currently really into that show. I'm so happy for you right now. I hate that it's taken this long, but I'm happy for you. Like, it's time. I know. (laughs) But, you know, the, the, the good thing is... Now I have a lot to binge. You do. Man, it's- I was literally having lunch right now and, and before coming on the taping and was watching an episode. It's funny, though, because um, sometimes they say that that show and also The Simpsons, like, predicted the future. Really? <laughs> yes. There have been, so, like, I'll have to share some with you later, but there's, like, memes of where, like, like the Simpsons have like created like a scenario and it's like, Oh my gosh, that actually happened like two years ago. Yeah. They, I feel like some of them have a pulse on the future. Yeah. I, I had heard about the, I had heard about the Simpsons. I'd never heard about central park though. Well, I also didn't know it existed. So <laughs> that part, <laughs> but that's fun. I'm, I want to hear from you later on like, what is your favorite episode? I'll let you know. I'm still on like episode three, but I'm very, very, very happy. Um, that's what I plan to do tonight after I finish work is just watch a little Central Park and relax. Get make some time for myself. Mm-hmm. Well, today, as we make time for ourselves, let's also make time for Chrissy's interview with Natalie Kogan. Um, so again, this episode was taped a while ago. Uh while well, Christy was still here, and it's always great to hear her voice and hear her conversations with some of our, our incredible members of the community. And so Natalie Kogan is a leading expert on emotional fitness. She's an entrepreneur, best-selling author, and keynote speaker on a mission to help millions of people struggle less and thrive more in work and life. Her latest book is The Awesome Human Project. Break free from daily burnout, struggle less, and thrive more in work and life. Let's go to Christy's interview with Natalie. (laughs) 
Natalie, hello and welcome back to the Elevate podcast. I am so thrilled to be back. Thank you. It's great to talk to you. Last time you were on the podcast, I remember we were meeting in person in the office and now we are virtual, but um, <laughs> it is still uh, feels like I'm in the same room with you. So I, yeah, I cannot it's great to connect. Well, let's let's get started uh, reintroducing you to our community. Could you share a bit about who you are and, and your story and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, I'll try to keep it short so you guys don't have to hear a Natalie TED Talk, although I just need to say that is not my core skill. I'm not good at shutting up. It's probably why I speak for a living. Um, so uh, what I do in my day-to-day is nothing I ever expected to do. You know, I run a company called Happier, and I teach emotional fitness skills to people and teams, and my whole raison d'etre, my whole mission in life is to help people struggle less so they can thrive more. But uh, it's even just saying that sounds weird because I grew up in a former Soviet Union and as a Russian Jew, struggle was the way. I think struggle was my only religion growing up. And you know, I grew up in a family where struggle was elevated to, yeah, if you're gonna do anything meaningful in life, you gotta struggle. And you know, coming to the US as a refugee, as a teenager was brutal, it was a really hard experience. And so it just confirmed to me, yeah, life is hard, life is struggle. And I, the only thing I kind of knew how to do was work hard. So I just threw myself into my work and, you know, I, I really believe this idea that if I just work really hard and I accomplish really great things and I have a meaningful career and take care of my family, then all the struggle will be worth it. And I'll get to some kind of, I don't know, euphoria. I really did believe that. And so I spent 20 years working very, very hard, building a very, very successful career in, um, of finance and technology. I was a venture capitalist for five years. I, I got into VC at a bright age of 25 in an industry with fewer than 6% women. I'm actually very proud of that. Um, I spent some time at McKinsey and Microsoft and Happier as a fifth startup that I either was founded or was part of the founding team. And in the midst of all that, I you know learned to speak English without an accent. I was very proud of that. Married my college sweetheart named Avi. We just celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary. Our daughter is now going to our alma mater. And, you know, on the outside, I lived this dream, this true American dream, but on the outside, struggle, struggle. That's all I knew. And I, what I mean by struggle is uh, I never honored my humanness. That's my shortest shorthand. I ignored myself as a human being and I ignored my mental health, my emotional health. I mean, these words I'm saying right now weren't even my vocabulary because I thought if you're going to achieve anything, you're going to need to struggle. Uh, the euphoria didn't come. What happened instead several years ago, I completely burnt out and it was very, very scary. Um, burnout is a complicated thing we can talk about it. We all experience it differently. For me, it was just my world went dark. Um, I, someone turned off the ignition. It was very scary. Uh, as a mom, I could hardly function as a CEO of a company called Happier. Uh, we can all laugh a little bit. I could hardly function. Uh, looking back, I'd been burning out daily for years. I just had no awareness because, again, who cares about how I feel? Nobody ever talked to me about that as a leadership skill or a success skill. And um, it was really scary time, but it was a gift. Uh, and the gift was that I stopped for the first time in my life. I just stopped because I couldn't. I couldn't keep pushing myself um, the way that I was before. And I didn't know what to do. I was googling things like how to feel more okay. Like literally, I was googling like how to feel better. Um, I'm a geek, so I did a lot of research in neuroscience and cognitive behavior therapy, and I got into Buddhism and yoga, and uh, little by little, a lot of trial, a lot of error, uh, I got myself to a much better place. I really healed myself, and it was all by doing something I'd never imagined I would do. It was all by going inside and creating a more supportive relationship with myself, which is how I define emotional fitness. So I then changed my whole world around and changed my whole career around and even what we were doing with Happier and said, if this can work for me, I need to teach this to others. And I really do feel like I found water in the desert. And that's what I do today. So I teach these science-backed skills to help people struggle less. And I will teach them to anyone who will listen, including all of you now. Thank you for sharing that story. And I think it's something we can all, most of us can really relate to. Mm. Um, Talk, talk to me about, you know, level set us with where we are today. What are mm -hmm. you hearing from the people you are supporting and you're having conversations with? Like, where are we as, as humans um, in, in the context of, of being happier and, and burnout and just, you know, getting through the day 
uh, making space for ourselves. I mean, there's so many themes here, but I, I think that's all been under the microscope more, but yeah. also in part because we don't know how to do it. Uh, I actually want to start right where, with what you just said in terms of how we're doing. Um, I think I, I have given, I think I was sharing before, before with you. So I've given something like 300 virtual talks throughout the pandemic to every kind of group you can think of, companies, teams. I did a lot of pro bono um, talks for hospitals and doctors and nurses. And um, I didn't do a single talk on happiness. All my talks were about skills to help you struggle less, skills to help you handle uncertainty. And the reason I say that is we're all so far below the line right now joy and happiness is really far out of reach. Um, I have this really crude way that I think about it. So if you think about like baseline, right? When you're at baseline, you're kind of doing okay. Eh, you might have some stressful days here and there, but it's normal, you're feeling okay. Below the line is where we are. Uh, we have used up all of our surge capacity to handle stress. We all have a lot of capacity to handle stress. We've used it up about a year and a half ago. Uh, we are carrying a tremendous amount of accumulated stress, accumulated energy depletion. So we're all below the line. Happiness and joy are above the line. They're so out of reach. And so I think the most important thing, and these are all the, the conversations I'm having in the talks and the work I'm doing, we have to get to the baseline. We have to refuel our energy. We have to process this accumulated stress. We have to learn how to honor our humanness. And then we can think about joy and happiness. But I don't think I have worked with a team or given a talk where, you know, I, I encountered something different. And I actually, I just do want to say that it gives me a lot um, of hope because we are in a similar place and there is a lot of desire and willingness that I see um, from all kinds of different people to figure out how to feel better, how to be better on our own and how to help people around us. But um, yeah, this is where we are. So how do we change that? <laughs> well, you know, the, the it's, question. yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, it is possible. You know, I am, um, I do this thing in my talks now where I ask people at the end, I mean, you know, I'm, I can't, I'm not going to go through a whole talk right now. Don't worry. Um, because, you know, if you let me, I would. So we have to watch me. Uh, but I have them close their eyes at the end. And I ask them to just imagine what it would feel like to not feel like they're struggling. What it would feel like to have more energy. And then I have them open their eyes and tell them, like, that feeling is possible. But we have to take the steps. And this is what emotional fitness is all about. It's not about being tough. It's not about always being positive. It's a skill of creating a more supportive relationship with yourself. And that's what we all need to prioritize now. And it actually begins with awareness. Um, the thing that I never had before I burnt out, the thing that we are not taught in schools or in MBA programs, we have to practice daily awareness. So a practice that I've been teaching to everyone that I just want to share is I call it the check-in. And it's very simple. Just take a moment. You can take a moment right now and just check in with yourself and ask yourself, how am I doing? And don't judge what comes up. Be as specific as possible. So instead of saying, I'm stressed out, okay, go to the next level. Like, I'm really stressed out about having too many things to do. I'm really stressed out about this uncertain thing. But practicing that daily awareness is huge because awareness gives us choices. If we just kind of run through our days just trying to make it through the day, which is what I was doing before I burnt out, well, then I just hit the wall. And we check in with family and friends and colleagues, right? We ask each other, how, how are you doing? And so we need to begin with that awareness. We need to start checking in on ourselves. And then also constantly sends our brain a signal that how I feel matters. I care about myself. And that's huge. Um, the interesting thing about reducing stress, I'll just pick stress as an example. Um, it matters less what you do to reduce stress and it matters more that you do it. So for example, if I told you that... Um, uh, I think that if I eat 50 almonds in the next hour, I will reduce my stress. Uh, if I eat 50 almonds in the next hour, I will reduce my stress. It's a placebo effect, and it's one of the most powerful things we have within our control. So if you begin this daily practice of checking in with yourself because you care about yourself and you want to support yourself, that in and of itself is going to help you start to feel a little more care to, taken care of a little bit better. Um, and the other thing I would say is, you know, um, so there's these five core emotional fitness skills that I teach. And one of them is self-care. And self-care is just the most horribly mismarketed concept in our culture. I 
hate the way that self-care is sold as some kind of luxury or as something you need to spend money on, or that's something that takes a lot of time. The way that I define self-care, it's a skill of fueling your emotional, mental, and physical energy. That's what self-care is. And as human beings, there's literally nothing we can do without energy. And our energy right now is depleted. And so creating a daily 10 minute practice to fuel your energy, I call it a mini fuel up. 10 minutes a day to do something that fuels your energy, whether it's a walk outside or sitting down with your favorite chocolate bar or drinking some tea or reading a couple pages from a fiction book that you're really enjoying, 10 minutes a day starts to make a difference. And so these are, you know, I'm sharing a couple small practices, but it's small things like this and doing them consistently that have huge impact on our well-being and how we feel. Natalie, I really appreciate the the examples you gave, and and, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, so I I love reading and uh, fiction, like crappy crime novels. It's like no. I just, I well, I need it. some uh, recommendations when we're done. Thank you. Yeah, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, but, and, and to be honest, it was something that I, you know, especially early days of the pandemic, I, I really struggled with doing that. Um, you know, what, well, and I used to do it a lot when I was commuting, now I wasn't commuting and, but like, I just couldn't mentally get into the space mm-hmm. where I could mm-hmm. read. I mean, I was doom scrolling on social media or the news mm-hmm. or just you know, consuming whatever it is. And, um, now I do read and I love reading and I'll like find 10 mm-hmm. minutes of my day to just like, mm-hmm. I'm just going to stop reading my book. Yes. But, and, and, but the, the, but is I give myself a hard time about it. Mm. Not because I'm taking the 10 minutes to read a book, but because I'm saying, well, Christy, you should be out like doing jumping jacks or sit ups mm-hmm. or, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. I'm mm-hmm. minimizing what I'm doing by saying I should be doing something better for me or something more productive or something oh, yeah. else. And yeah. It's mm-hmm. a cycle we get into where we just are constantly kind of criticizing ourselves versus leaning into that's that, you know, time we're committing to whatever we need, whatever we need in that moment. Oh, I'm so excited that you brought this up. First of all, the fiction reading, I just want to like pause again on that and share something that I've started to do during the pandemic. So it was actually before the pandemic, I gave up listening to podcasts and I tremendously cut down on my news consumption because I realized both of those are energy draining. So um, I started to say, okay, I'm going to listen. So I take a five mile walk early every morning. That's kind of my like little Zen thing. And I um, used to listen to podcasts, found that they were stressing me out. So I started to listen to fiction and I loved it. It was like, I started to look forward to my walks because it was like, I get to listen to an interesting book. So during the pandemic, one of the things that I started to do, and I'm going to say I do this about mm, 70% of the time. Um, And I'm saying this on purpose because with any practice, we have to give ourselves room to like not do it and not call it falling off the wagon. So expect 70%. And then when you do it, you feel good. Um, Is When I have my morning coffee, I get my coffee and I sit, I have this big red chair in my office and I get, I have a pile of books. I'm looking at it right now. They're all fiction um, on different kinds of topics. And I have a pile of books that are kind of more spiritual um, kind of literature And I'll just pick a book, maybe it's about an artist, maybe it's about, you know, something else. And I'll just read while I'm having my coffee and I make sure my phone is far away from me. I would say it's been one of the best investments in my self-care and energy that I've ever had. I now literally associate like the chair with like that little practice. And so I just wanted to share that. I think reading things unrelated to work um, and cutting down on news and not picking up your phone for 10 minutes while you do that is one of the best gifts we can give ourselves. But yes, then the brain comes and it's like, hey, Natalie, did you just relax for a couple of minutes? Mm-mm-mm, I don't think so. This is not what you should be doing. You should be stretching because your hip hurts or you should have been doing yoga. One of the things I used to do a lot of yoga And during the pandemic, I just haven't felt like it. I mean, I do it from home. We have my yoga studio went online, but I used to do it like four times a week. And then I'd sit in my chair and my brain would be like, oh my God, you should be doing yoga. You're so lazy. And so the reason I'm sharing all this is because two things we have to realize. We have this voice in our head that's going to tell us that we should be doing something we're not. That there's a lot of reasons we have that voice. It comes from fear. It comes from a lot of, you know, what we've learned throughout our lifetime just because your brain gives you a thought doesn't mean you have to go along with it. 
So just because your brain is telling you, you should not be reading this crime fiction that you're really enjoying, or just because my brain is telling me like, oh, you should do more yoga, doesn't mean I have to go along with it. And this is core to the practice of creating a supportive relationship with ourselves. It's also creating a supportive relationship with our thoughts. Because when your brain is telling you that, it, it's coming from some kind of fear. Fear of, I don't know, not being in great shape or not like checking off enough things on your to-do list or whatever it is. So we have to talk back to our brain. This is one of the core skills I talk about in my book, The Awesome Human Project, is talking back to my brain. So I literally will do that when my brain's like, oh, you're sitting around drinking your coffee with your book. You should be doing yoga. I talk back to my brain and I go, okay, so you're afraid that I'm getting inflexible or getting fat or getting out of shape because I'm not doing yoga, but that's actually not true. So don't exaggerate. Uh, what I'm doing right now fuels my energy. Please calm down. This is actually really, really helpful for me. And I literally talk to myself that way. And it's a really, really powerful technique. So that's what I offer you when your brain tells you, oh, you should be doing something else talk back to your brain kindly because your brain is part of you, but recognize it's coming from some kind of fear and you need to calm it like a, you would a scared child. Can you tell me more about the Awesome Human Project? Yes. Uh, I wrote a book during the pandemic. Um, I feel like I need to get that on a t-shirt. <laughs> I really do. I feel like I need to put that on a t-shirt. Hi, I'm Natalie. And I decided it was a good idea to write a book during the pandemic. I do think it was a really great idea. Um, because it's a book that came out in February. It's called The Awesome Human Project, Break Free from Daily Burnout, Struggle Less and Thrive More in Work and Life. And I don't think I could have imagined a book that we all needed more or that I needed to write more than this one. Um, and it's a book that I wrote uh, to help people learn these skills that you and I are talking about, these skills, uh, these emotional fitness skills to create a more supportive relationship with ourselves. And at the core of the book is a premise which uh, the before burnout Natalie would throw out the window and not even listen to. And the premise is challenge in life is constant. I mean, we've just, we're living through a huge challenging time, but challenge is always there. It's somebody cuts you off. You have too much to do at work. Your kid is sick. You feel bad. Like challenge is part of life, but struggle, your inner experience of life, your inner experience of the challenge struggle is optional. It really is. We can reduce how much we struggle internally, even when life is difficult. And again, for me, this is kind of breaking with every root and everything I've grown up with, but um, it's a huge insight that I had. And so there are ways to reduce struggle. And the way that we reduce our struggle internally is by creating this more supportive relationship with our thoughts, our emotions, ourselves, and other people. And then we have much more capacity, more energy, more ability to actually handle the difficult things in our lives and enjoy them. So that's the core kind of foundation of the book. And, um, you know, I share five core emotional fitness skills and tons of practices and lots of examples and stories. And it's a book that has my art on the cover, which is a huge thing for me to sort of be coming out as an artist um, also as part of this. But it's been, um, it's been incredibly meaningful. The book's been out for a few months and it's been incredibly meaningful to hear from people uh, write in or meet me at my speaking engagements and tell me, uh, wow. I didn't know I needed this, but this is kind of my lifeline right now. That That is amazing. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's helped me so much um, to, to lean into, you know, these insights from others, you know, like yourself, Natalie. And, and yes, mm -hmm. I think you wrote a book during a pandemic. It's uh it's an amazing thing for, for so many of us that benefit from it because if there's one thing, you know, that I learned during the pandemic, well, there's two big things. And one is I absolutely, you know, put everyone before myself. Mm -hmm. um, when you talked about that, like, you know, that, that mm -hmm. self affirmation and like asking yourself what you need, it was, um, you know, I, I need to homeschool my children. I need to run a business. I need to lead my team. I need to support our employees. I need to support our community. I need to, you know, do all these hats and all these things we need to do for everybody. And, uh, and I personally think I was really resistant to when someone was like, well, set boundaries and ask for help and don't do all those things. And, you know, my answer is always like, but I have to, there's no choice. I have to. And then I started to, you know, really 
be inspired by people like you, Natalie, who are normalizing, you know, this conversation, but then coming up with, you know, real, real ways in which we can change that internal narrative um, and, mm. and be that awesome human and connect with ourselves and, and what we need and, you know, just become more comfortable with, um, you know, directing our own happiness and, and what, you know, that means for us. And the thing about that, that I think we all actually know deep down, the thing about that is when we take care of our own humanness, when we embrace our inner awesome human, when we honor ourselves, when we fuel ourselves, everybody we impact benefits. And I think we know that, you know, one of the, one of the things I say probably more often in any talk or leadership program that I do is you can't give what you don't have. And I think we all know that. I think ultimately, deep down, we all have this wisdom that we know we cannot give from empty. We cannot give from struggle as much as we could if we were struggling less, if we were honoring ourselves. And I think that's really, really important to recognize that as human beings, we're all connected. We are all connected to our people in our families, our friends, our co-workers, people we meet randomly, people who hear our talks, who read our books, who read our work, we're all connected. And, you know, when we get to that place where our brain is telling us that other people need us and we don't have time for ourselves and where we feel guilty taking time for ourselves, I think it's really important to go to that place of wisdom and ask like, well, what is it that I want to bring to other people? Because I'll tell you what, when I am exhausted and depleted, what I bring to other people, yeah, I, I can write decent content and I can still give a good talk. Is it great? No. Does it come with a lot of light and hope, which is what I am really on a mission? My mission is to give people hope and then steps to get there. Can I do that if I'm exhausted? Nope. My family gets snappy, Natalie. I start snapping at everybody. Um, I don't have patience. Um, and these are just some examples of what I bring, what I give when I am depleted. And I, I, I really think it's really important to get honest with ourselves about that and to be really open about that, because that to me breaks this separation. Like we're living with this false dichotomy that it's me and then there's others. That's a bunch of BS. There isn't such thing. Like my ability to have a good conversation with you on this podcast that can hopefully benefit people who are listening to it is directly dependent on the fact that this morning I took a walk and before I took a break and I had a good snack. Otherwise, this conversation would not be meaningful. It would not be helpful to people. And so I think at the core of it is just to stop focusing so much on the separatedness of like, well, this is me and this is others and I need to focus on others and to recognize that we're really all connected. And if each of us would make it a priority to fuel ourselves and honor our own humanness, it makes us really great at honoring each other. Yeah. And, and that, is, that is so true. And, and yet we, you know, we continue to feed into um, just, just the whatever you know the the things that don't fill our cup if you will mm -hmm. um you know I, I shared with you before the podcast that I you know especially during the past couple of years really reassessed a lot of what I was doing I followed which I think many of us do it's like okay what's the checklist of what it means to be a successful you know woman in business or you know business person it's like okay I need public speaking and I need to join a board and multiple mm. boards and be this and this and that and do, you know, and we, we keep doing so many things that in theory, like in my brain, I'm like, well, this is for me because this is going to help my career and this is going to help, you know, my, my impact, my purpose. But at the end of the day, it's all things where you're giving of yourself mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. giving to yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you can't start with like, what do I need? What is fulfilling mm -hmm. for me? What mm -hmm. will fill my cup? Then you, you're just constantly draining it and you have nothing left. Mm -hmm. and so I had to really step back and with a critical eye say, okay, like I'm evaluating all of these different touch points, these different aspects of my life and what, what is meaningful and what is not, what is supporting me, what is not. And how do I carve out more of that space to focus on me and, and what I need? And I think, you know, again, I, it's such a great, I love that you're sharing this because 
um, I think it takes humility to recognize we just don't have unlimited energy. You know, one of the things I've been talking about a lot in my talks is, can we all just please take off our superhero capes? You know, like before I burnt out, I used to love when people would call me a superwoman. My ego was so happy. I was like, oh, Natalie, you're such a superwoman. You do, you accomplish so many things. And I'd be like, oh my God, I'm so, and my ego was like so happy. I'm like, great. I haven't slept in forever and I'm exhausted and I hate life, but hey, I'm a super superwoman. Nobody is a superhero. Being human is hard enough. And I think that we need to practice this humility that we are human beings and we have a limited amount of mental, emotional, spiritual, physical energy, and we cannot give it to everything. We cannot give it to everything we may want to do. We have to be choosy with our attention, our energy, our focus, which means we have to say no. And, you know, there's so, I feel like setting boundaries has become this really hot topic. I'm glad it's become a hot topic, but I feel like a lot of the conversation about it doesn't really go to the core. You know, people tell me all the time, like, I'm afraid to say no, like, I'm really exhausted, but I don't want to say no to my friends about hanging out because they'll be mad at me. And I just look at them and say, if your friend is going to be angry at you because you need to honor yourself and say no, is this the kind of friend that you want in your life, right? If you say no to a business opportunity, like this is a fear that I really have had to get over. You know, my business is me. I'm the, my, I'm the brand, right? And so for me to say no to a talk or to a business opportunity, you know, the fear in my brain is like, oh my God, what if they never ask me again? I don't know. They, what if the world for, I think ultimately we have this fear, like what if I get quiet and the world forgets about me? That, that's an irrational fear. And, and it, we have to get to this place of, I really think it's about humility of recognizing we can't do all things always. And to me, it's also about making trade-offs and getting really clear about what is most important to you. And, and then saying yes to those things and then saying no to a lot of other stuff so you have enough energy for the stuff that's most important. And so I, I was sharing with you before when we were chatting, I've been doing this weekly live show on Zoom and a podcast since the pandemic began, Awesome Human Hour. It's been incredible. It's helped literally tens of thousands of people. People have called it their lifeline. So many business opportunities have come my way, you know, all this stuff. And a couple of weeks ago, I realized it was burning me out with travel, you know, back and I'm speaking on the road and I, it was burning me out. And so last week I announced to our community that I'm moving into once a month and I had fear. I didn't want to disappoint people. I know how many people really depend on that hour in their week. And I, I had to honor my bigger why. I had to really get clear with myself. What is my, what, what is most meaningful to me? And my bigger why for my work is, again, as I shared, like I want to help as many awesome humans as I can struggle less and thrive more. And I'd like to do it for a while. And I want to do it in, in a really great way. And in order for me to honor that, I need to say no to this weekly show and other things because I need to preserve my energy. And I shared all this and I have to tell you the only thing I got back was love. That's the only word that I have. I don't mean romantic love. I just mean love and understanding and support. And I'm sharing this because we all have this fear that if we say no to opportunities or to people, you know, our little scared brain is like, oh, people won't like me. The world will forget about me now. If you're doing it to honor yourself so that you can honor what's most important to you, that's the right path. But yeah, it does involve getting you know humble about the fact that we have limited amount of energy and minutes and attention, and we have to focus on what's most meaningful to us. Thank you for sharing that story. Natalie, for our listeners, so one piece of advice you want to give them, one thing that we should walk away with today and, and you know, I don't know, take action on or be, think about. I know you talked about, you know, checking in with ourselves, but and anything else that we we need to be very intentional about in our lives? Yeah, and I guess I, I'm, you know, so many of the things I've shared have been around managing our energy. And I guess that's the one thing I'd love to kind of end with and ask our listeners to think about becoming more aware of your energy and that's checking in, but also, just getting really choosy about where you invest your energy because there's, it's not possible to put it everywhere. Um, and so getting choosy and getting intentional about where we invest our attention and energy and checking in with ourselves to make sure that we're investing our attention and energy into things that are actually important to us or meaningful to us or fueling for us, I think is um, if we could all do that consistently, I think it really helps to make the right choices. Natalie, thank you so much for 
joining us today. And, and how would our listeners um, learn more about the work that you're doing and stay connected with you? Yeah, nataliekogan.com is my website. Lots of things there, more info about the book and my YouTube channel. And I'm Natalie Kogan on all the socials, primarily, I think Instagram and LinkedIn are my favorites these days. Um, and I'd love to connect with everyone there. But if you just go to nataliekogan.com, all the things are there. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Natalie, for joining us and for all of your advice and inspiration. Thank you. I love being um, able to share with awesome, awesome humans who are women and always enjoy our conversation. So thank you. Wow, that was great. I needed some some insights on how to how to really take some time for yourself and struggle less. I the burnout conversation keeps coming up so much lately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the burnout conversation has been happening a lot and and I don't think it's going to stop. So, people like Natalie who are helping helping us kind of navigated in different ways are are important at this point definitely took a lot of notes definitely took a lot of things that i think that i can bring back and i'd love to share those with other people because it affects everyone in different ways so yeah very insightful yeah well speaking of insightful if you're looking for insights from some other people who've been in your shoes who are navigating similar challenges in their work and in their life, please join us for one of our roundtables. Uh, we host roundtables every week, and it's a safe space. It's a forum where you can come, hear a little bit from a guest expert, and then get to meet other women in breakout rooms and ask them questions and you know, get to know them. It's completely safe space. It's I always say what happens at a roundtable stays at a roundtable. And so if you want to come hang out with me, you can come uh, to our executive roundtable on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. The next one is on leading a business through a recession or economic downturn, which I'm very interested in. Our rising leaders will be meeting on Thursday at noon Eastern. And the topic is advocating for inclusivity by calling in instead of calling out. So how do you make that impact while you have the power instead of just piecing out from your work. Let's let's try and change that culture. And the our entrepreneurs who meet on Thursdays at 4 p.m. will be talking about how to launch a mastermind based on your life experience. So if you're feeling lonely, if you want some support, join a roundtable. Have you been to a roundtable, Myra? Yes. Uh, the last one that I went to, it was, I'll be honest, it was a little bit ago, but it was the Rising Leaders Roundtable. I feel like that for me is one that I feel most aligned to. Mm -hmm. And I really love that this one's for advocating uh, inclusivity. I think that's really, really strong topic. So I'm interested to see, you know, just, just the whole fold out of how that conversation goes. Yeah, the Rising Leader group is great. I mean, I, I started that roundtable a while ago and I do miss hosting it now that I'm hosting the executive one. Uh, but I pop in every now and then because it's it's just a fantastic group. I do feel so spoiled because along with like the chapter events, the roundtables, I feel like I'm just like surrounded by like all of this amazing energy and just like information. So I'm just like trying to soak it up as much as I can. Yeah, we are very lucky. Um, and now to go to our history makers. Do you want to do the honors with our first history maker this year? So yeah, absolutely, Maricela. We have Aminata Toure, um, became Germany's first black woman cabinet minister. That is amazing. Wow. Lieutenant Amanda Lee became the first woman member of the Navy's famed Blue Angels aerial demonstration team. And next we have Drupadi Murmu, uh, will be the first president of India from one of the nation's indigenous tribes. Katarzyna Ziedlo became the first woman from Poland to medal in the 20K race walk at the World Athletics Championships. 20K is a lot of Ks. <laughs> okay, next we have Sofia Namvite, uh, will play the first female dwarf in Lord of the Rings franchise. Ooh, I love that. I, <laughs> I am 
so happy to hear that because I love the Lord of the Rings. Yes, I'm a nerd. We already know that. I will own it. And I am so happy there's going to be a female dwarf. <laughs> and Rafaela Petrini, Yvonne Rungoat, and Maria Lia Servino became the first women named to the Vatican Congregation for Bishops, the office that helps select bishops across the globe. That's pretty exciting. Oh, yeah. Well, some great history makers this week. Uh, please send us your your achievements, your things that you'd like to celebrate with us. We're always here and want to celebrate with you um, all of your accomplishments. You can find us on Twitter at Elevate MTWK. You can email us at podcast at elevate network.com. Um, just shoot us a note. We'll, we're here to celebrate with you. And um, Myra, thanks for being here with me. Oh, thanks for having me. I had such a good time. Yeah, I know you're you're gonna be on the next one, so it's it's we get to do this all over again. And next week we'll be hearing from Sylvia Bug, who is PBS's chief programming executive and general manager. She's bolstering PBS commitment to be a vital community resource through her focus on initiatives that touch social justice, climate and environment, and health and wellness. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what she has to share. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to Elevate. If you like what you hear, help a girl out. Subscribe to the Elevate podcast on iTunes. Give us five stars and share your review. Also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Elevate NTWK. That's Elevate Network. And become a member. You can learn all about membership and all the great things that Elevate Network is doing at our website, www.elevatenetwork.com that's e-l-l-e-v-a-t-e network.com and special thanks to our producer Catherine Heller she rocks and to our voiceover artist Rachel Griesinger thanks so much and join us next week